program. <laughs> this opioid safety program uh, is completely unfunded right now. Um, we are pretty much working without any funds. A lot of these um, gadgets and all of the Narcan is um, kind of given to us for free from the California Department of Public Health. Um, we've kind of been able to accumulate a few items here and there and create some education materials around it. So we're really hoping to get into the realm of actually getting full funding so we can have a sustainable program and um, move forward in a little bit more substantial way in the future. Um, but it is really exciting to have this available to us and get it started. Do you have a question? Just so Okay. <laughs> um, we usually have everyone sign in on a QR code and I have a few like pre and post questions just to kind of get everyone um, their mind going about um, stats and the current state of opioids within Calaveras as well as the state as well as the uh, country. Um, however, I, we have a small group here so we can make it more of a discussion session which kind of makes it a little bit easier. Uh, let's see. So as I said, we usually have the first part where we do a test your knowledge, kind of get everyone's minds moving the direction of um, the status of opioids in Calaveras specifically and then um, a broader view. The current state of the opioid crisis, I will go over what that looks like, especially in this county. Um, and then overdose prevention, the methodology behind that, some like strategies to use even beyond Narcan. Um, and then we'll go into the Narcan Naloxone administration and do a demo as well as a post quiz. So the main learning objectives for today are to understand the local and national opioid crisis. Um, this is something that is happening not only in um, our world, but also in the world around us, um, so the entire world itself. And then we will also go over um, how to identify and respond to an opioid overdose, and then learn how to administer Narcan or Naloxone. So all of you should have a training kit in front of you. Those are purely trained, they're all expired. Um, but they are a good tool just kind of see how to open the box, how to get familiar with it, and that way if it ever comes to the time where you need to use this, you know where to go, you know how to use it. So like I said, we usually have a test your knowledge, but I can do these questions um, verbally right now. Let's see. So, first question. Oh, these are the really answers. All right, first question. How many opioid overdoses, uh, overdose deaths in 2020 involved an opioid in the U.S.? Um, so we usually have a few percentage options, but um, we'll go ahead and show those. 25%, 40%, 65%, or 75%. I kind of showed you the answer, so you already know. It is 75%. We usually like to show these answers at the end, just so you guys are looking for the answers throughout the presentation. Um, but this is a good indicator of how strong, how much of a strong hold opioids have. Um, please note that not all drug overdoses are opioids. There are other drugs you can OD on. Um, however, in this case, opioids have kind of taken a dominant majority. Um, next question is how many more opioid overdose deaths were reported in 2021 compared to 2020 in Calaveras County alone? So our options are two times, three times, four times, and five times. Um, four times more. Um, it, it's been pretty extensive, and this data is usually underreported. Um, and so this is kind of just what we know right now. Um, but it is pretty much going upward. We haven't reached a plateau. We haven't stopped. Go ahead. Can we ask questions as we go yeah. along, or will it be covered later? Because we have a small group, it's easier to have that discussion. So, you want to go ahead. so who, I'm just uh, curious how they're reported. Who reports these to the county? That's a great question. I can kind of go over this a little bit later, yeah. um, but a lot of it is based on data that we get either from hospital systems or the coroner. But mm -hmm. however, you only get this data from the coroner if they are asked to actually perform a toxicology report, and that's not always asked. And so that is why it's severely underreported because it's not mm -hmm. necessarily all there. That's already bad enough. Exactly. And then true or false, the only way you can obtain Narcan is with the doctor's prescription. That's false. Awesome, love that. 
And then if you are sure someone has overdosed, do not administer Narcan true or false. This false. is a trick question. Yes. All right, and then next question. How long does Narcan or Naloxone work in the body? Options are 30 to 90 minutes, 15 to 30 minutes, five to 15, or two to five minutes. So this is not how long it takes to react, but how long it's actually acting in the body. Does anyone know the answer? Eight, 15. I'm guessing two to five. That's how long it takes to actually start. So this, I was gonna guess 15, 15, 15 30 to 90 30. seems darker, so I'm gonna go with that. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Have you had this training before? No, sir. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what was the answer? What was the answer? What was 30, 30 to 90 minutes. 30 to 90 minutes? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And we'll yeah. go, we could go over these questions okay. at the end, too. Yeah. They'll pop back up. Oh, how long it lasts? Oh, yeah. Last we can get the yeah. slides. Yeah. I can definitely send the slides yeah. to all of you. Oh, that'd be awesome. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Oh. Okay. All right. So this is kind of just a general overview of how we got to this place with opioids. Um, a lot of this opioid crisis began in the 1990s. Prescription opioids became increasingly popular without any regulation around it. There was limited federal regulations around who could prescribe, how many prescriptions you can give. It was actually a really trusted medication. Um, there was really no scientific evidence at that time showing that was addictive. It was about this time that people started picking up on the signs that it actually was addictive. There was a lot of naysayers in that realm as well. Um, and so it wasn't until 2010 um, when the federal agencies and a few of well, like, uh, states started to recognize the addictiveness of this and started putting regulations on this. When they did that, um, those who were already using opioids started looking for alternatives. There was limited alternatives, so they turned to heroin. Um, so heroin became common as prescription opioids were not really accessible anymore. This is where you see your second major uh, peak of overdose deaths. Um, your first one came in 1990s. And then in 2013, synthetic opioid use was, was introduced, especially with fentanyl or tramadol, and, and that increased around 2013, where a third wave of opioid overdose deaths quickly followed. We have not peaked yet. We are still going up. So are you considering synthetic opioid products and opioid products all are they all grouped into one as far as they're all concerned? opioids but there are okay. different versions of them so you have your synthetic what's considered natural and semi-synthetic okay thank you so um in terms of stats the national opioid crisis today there were 136 people that die every day from an opioid overdose in the united states this is actually lower um there was new data that came out in 2022 I think, where it says 180 people die every day. 75% of those um, opioid overdose deaths were due to an opioid themselves. That was out of 90,000 drug overdoses. This is a really good uh, resource for data collection. We'll get into your question here. Um, so California Department of Public Health has this uh, really good resource called Skylab. Um, where they kind of are able to do a heat map in each uh, county and create this visual for each individual um, county to kind of look at what the state of opioid overdoses and the opioid use in each county looks like. Um, it's kind of in the beginning stages, so like I said, a lot of the data is underreported and not necessarily shown here, but it is a really good start to showing and displaying and sharing this education on um, the status within our own communities. And so here um, we can see about 37,000 total opioid prescriptions were given in 2021 to Calaveras County residents alone. If you are familiar with Calaveras County, you know that there are about 47,000 deaths in total. And so with that said, um, these do include duplicates. So if someone had multiple prescriptions given to them, that's counted in here. Um, but it is uh, pretty predominant, and this is only prescriptions. This is not necessarily what's happening on the ground where people are getting them um, through other avenues. 30% increase in opioid-related emergency department visits from 2020 to 2021 alone in this county. And then there were four times more opioid overdose deaths alone um, reported in 2020 compared to 20, 2021 compared to 2020. So is that dark region, is that up by West 
touch point? Yes. 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 So this data kind of shows opioid prescriptions by patient location. So again, this is only what's tracked via like our medical records. Um, but you can see here that um, this heat map shows like the darker region is where the majority of prescriptions are going. Um, however, this is not necessarily the same overlay where opioid overdose deaths reported are like it's not the same. Um, so Angels Camp is actually our highest um, in terms of opioid overdose deaths reported right now. And we don't necessarily know why. Um, it could be because the data is not all there, but it is still, um, if we go into the um, filter of everything. One, one concerning thing is happening, because my, my mother was on a low dose of hydrocodone, mm -hmm. um, and uh, CVS has run out of hydrocodone. Mm -hmm. And luckily, she has a pain management doctor, and they switched her to a low dose of Tylenol and codeine. Um, we've been trying to wean her mm -hmm. off it, um, but I'm just worried because I was in the doctor's office and somebody came into the doctor's office and was saying, you know, they won't fill my hydrocodone, you know, what am I supposed to do? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so that those people, you know, if, if they don't have a doctor who's going to work with them to switch them to something, they may go out and try to get it off the street. So, exactly. I mean, they ran out first, it was fives, um, then then they ran out of 10 milligrams, which I was breaking in half and trying to, you know. Mm -hmm. to, to yeah, it was, it. It, it's, it, I, I, and when I looked into it, Congress limited the amount mm -hmm. of hydrocodone that could be um, given out and given so, out and so there's a shortage there is and That's you are not the first awesome. to highlight this especially in this region um, we've actually gotten a few calls about this as well it's not really in our control in terms of being oh, able yeah. to do something about it which is super frustrating because we get that same aspect where people are starting to look for alternatives and we have dealers in this area who are targeting those individuals so what we have now uh, we've had a few reports of literally we have an aging population in West Point. We have a few people who are giving them methamphetamine, less oh. laced with heroin, and, and then you get into this realm of being addicted to an opioid. Um, so you keep going back into that withdrawal phase, and so you keep going back to that dealer because you want that drug again. Um, and so it is a really prominent way, and it's very intricate in terms of how people get to it. Um, we also have heard a few reports. We've talked to the um, emergency services here, especially our ambulance services, and um, one of their most prominent um, responses is usually to give Narcan for someone who's unconscious because it's a way to eliminate or like figure out if that was the case um, or if someone was actually overdosing on an opioid. Um, because what we have seen, especially like you're looking at Foothill Village or um, senior centers where individuals have those fentanyl patches, people forget to take them off. Oh. And so they'll patch them on over time, and then you'll throw yourself into an overdose without necessarily noticing that you have so many on you. Um, and that's kind of why we suspect Angel's Camp has the most reported deaths around fentanyl or opioid overdoses. Uh, <coughs> but it is a, a weird kind of non-expected way of, of getting into opioid overdoses, which is frustrating, but also it's just a form of education that we need to continue to do to in order to one thing to consider happen. too um from i was an ER nurse mm -hmm. and, and this happened to somebody i knew um i think with fentanyl patches a hot weather mm -hmm. people actually absorb it faster mm -hmm. and when we're having these high temperatures we may see an increase yeah it is it is a very dynamic and we're still learning about it so it is a very dynamic field that we're trying to stay on top of, but um, it, it's kind of taking a hold that we don't necessarily know how to uh, handle at this time. So what are opioids? As I was kind of saying before, there are a few versions. You have natural synthetic or semi-synthetic, um, but they are chemicals that interact with opioid receptors in the brain. Um, they usually react onto nerve cells in the body and brain and reduce the intensity of pain without actually eliminating the cause of the pain. So it basically just numbs it. You don't necessarily um, get rid of the, the source of the pain. Um, and so its use is prescribed for pain or, or it's used illicitly. There are some really good uses for it. 
We don't necessarily want to get rid of opioids in general. This is a really useful pain medication um, that serves a really good purpose, especially when it comes to healthcare. However, it is often misused. So the common types that we typically see are hydrocodone, oxycodone, morphine, heroin, and especially now fentanyl. Our risk groups are anyone who's exposed to opioids. There is no demographic, there's no age group that's more prone to this. Anyone who's prescribed to it, anyone who's exposed to it, is really susceptible to being addicted to it afterwards. So what is an opioid overdose? It occurs when opioids completely overwhelm your uh, brain receptors that are accepting those or receiving those opioids. Your respiration is completely suppressed. You kind of forget how to breathe. Um, and like I said, a person may stop breathing in total. Um, and then it can be caused by taking more opioids than prescribed, combining opioids with other depressants or substances, um, and taking more opioids than one can tolerate. So there are a few methods besides Narcan um, to um, help with overdose prevention. So our number one is to only take medication that is prescribed to you or uh, by a doctor and then tell your doctor about all other medications or substances you may be using. Um, do not take more medication or take it more often than prescribed. So if you do feel like you know that pain's coming back and you want to increase that dose, always talk to your provider first. Um, so call your doctor if the pain gets worse. Never mix pain medications with um, alcohol, sleeping pills, or any illicit substances. Dispose of unused medication properly. We have a disposal site at the sheriff's office. It's a safe disposal site if you want to get rid of any opioids. Um, teach your family members and friends the importance of opioid use awareness. So if you or someone you know is using, it's always great to have this Narcan around just to be covered somewhere. There's no adverse effects to Narcan. So if someone gets a hold of it, that's not supposed to. It's always good to have. It's only going to impact you if you're currently on opioids. And then learn the signs of an overdose and how to use naloxone to keep an overdose from becoming fatal. Can I add talking yeah. to your pharmacist to that list? Yes, definitely. That is also a good resource because they will probably know those chemical interactions if you're also using other substances. Correct. And they're also really good, um, especially here, if they are, if someone's being prescribed opioids, they will often pair it with Narcan, just send you home with all of it. Interesting. So what is naloxone? Um, it's a life-saving medication that, we can, that can reverse an overdose of opioids. Um, the reason it's so important, and the reason it's so important to have the safe space and talk to others about it, is because a bystander was present about 40% of opioid overdoses. That means 40% of opioid overdoses could have been reversed if someone was standing there with Narcan to help. Um, also, there are a few known adverse effects of Narcan. Q and I could take it right now. Nothing would happen unless we were currently on opioids. I'm going to skip that video because it's more like a commercial. So there are a few um, protections in place. So if anyone's feeling that they may be liable, um, for something, if they're using Narcan or a little timid about um, approaching someone who may have overdosed, there are a few um, laws in place to protect individuals who do end up helping others in this uh, situation. So the California Standing Order is basically like a blanket prescription for everyone to carry Narcan. So everyone's kind of covered and have this on them. Um, there's a drug overdose treatment liability law that eliminates civil and criminal liability for individuals that administer naloxone. And then there is also the Good Samaritan Law, which most people are kind of familiar with. Um, but this um, states that you cannot be liable for any civil damages that result in you acting upon an emergency for the safety of another individual. So I will go over this fun storage and handling process. Um, these are just kind of um, bits and points that you'll want to know if you are carrying naloxone. We do ask that you don't keep it in your car. Um, it is temperature sensitive, so um, it's always good to keep it, like if you have a purse with you, because you're always going to take that inside with you. Um, or if you have a keychain that you can hold it on or something like that. Um, but we do want to protect it from light, protect it from heat, just, just in case. Um, I think those are the main ones. Yeah, and then if it's frozen, then you can thaw it out, um, but it has to sit at room temperature for 15 minutes. Wow. 
Yes, exactly. Don't freeze it. It's just if it is, it would take 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. Open that freezer and see what So, what are some signs of an actual opioid overdose? Um, like I kind of said before, it completely suppresses breathing, which means you kind of go into a state of unconsciousness, but it also looks like you're not breathing. Um, so you'll see those fingernails, our lips um, are turning purple, blue, or gray. People will start to change color. Um, face goes extremely pale, feel, feels clammy to the touch, so we always encourage people to kind of touch people's faces, see how that feels. Body goes completely limp. They're non-responsive to any stimuli. You could, a lot of times we uh, encourage a sternum rub, just it's uncomfortable to do this to someone. So typically if no one's waking up from that, it's, all, it's always a good sign um, or a good indicator to administer Narcan. Um, individuals may start vomiting or making gurgling noises. This is always a good reason to put them in a rescue breathing position so that they're on their side and not necessarily inhaling a lot of that, um, anything that they're going to vomit up. Again, they cannot be awakened or completely unable to speak. You're not going to get really any response out of them. And then breathing or heartbeat slows or stops. So if you can't feel any pulse anywhere or hear any breathing, um, it's always good to administer an arcane after that as well. Haley, I did, I did want to ask that. Um, yeah. Some people tend to snore as well. Um, yeah. So keep out, look out for snoring. That is a mm -hmm. indicator as well. Thank that you. they're going down? Yeah, that they're it's starting to, that they're overdosed or dying, yes. So um, I will let you go over the portion of the demo right now, um, and then we'll have a 12-minute video to go over as well. But this portion will really get you familiar, familiarized with the process of actually administering Narcan and um, trying to identify someone who may be in an overdose. So just to give you an idea of what I do throughout the day, um, I work with all your first responders, uh, your schools, uh, different government agencies, so I make sure that they're supplied with Norcan. If anything is expired, I usually go and switch it out for them, right? Um, if, did everyone get one of these? Uh, quick start guide, okay? Did everyone get one of these? Okay. These are just training devices, so they have no drugs inside of it, okay? So uh, you'll have that. Uh, did I give everyone a box of Narcan? Yes. Yeah, so oh, I did. I get one. Okay, I get you one. Okay. Thank and what I do is I go over these steps real, um, real easy, slow and easy kind of. What I do is I ask you to read out loud to me. Um, I usually read the highlighted points. Okay. And just to get you familiar with uh, administering Narcan. Okay. All right. Got it. Now y'all a quiet group. <laughs> all right? You want me to yell a right Yeah. All right. <laughs> all right. There okay. we go. That's the spirit. Um, so, number one, you identify the opioid overdose and check for the response, right? Mm -hmm. Main thing we're going to do is ask the person. That's a highlight. Read with me. <laughs> Alive and well. You got it? Mm -hmm. We look confused. Okay. Oh, yes, yes. All right, here we go. Here we go. Wake up. Here we go. All right, number one. Identify the opioid overdose and check it for the response. Ask the ask. Ask shake check. Ask shake check. Okay. We're not working with teachers. All right, we're going. Here we go again. One. Identify the opioid overdose and check for response. Ask the person if okay. she or she is okay. We're okay. Right? Shout the name. Shake. Shoulders and shoulders rub the middle of their chest. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Check for signs of an opioid overdose. Will not wake, wake up or respond, or respond to the voice. Or voice or touch. Thank you. Slow, irregular, or the stop. Thank you. Pinpoint people. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Next, lay the person on their back to receive the Narcan and the nasal spray, right? So, make sure they're, they're on their back, right? I've had people ask me, can I administer the chair? Can I administer if they're on their stomach? And the answer is no, okay? <laughs> and is it better to have side. their arms over their head? Does that make a difference as opposed to having the No, it doesn't make a difference. Just down. make sure that they're on their back, right? Okay. okay? Um, now we're gonna go to two, right? Give the Narcan and nasal spray. Okay, I gave everybody a box, right? So this one's gonna move to that part. Uh, boxes is only for training. These are expired. Okay. So, 
open box. So you're going to remove Norcan. This is a safe training. Is it one you want me to open? No. no. That one's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's completely safe. Open. Yeah. So, Either one. We're going to take it home. <laughs> training. Oops, we still have that. So you're not going to spray in the box. Peel the back of the tab. Open it. Okay. Some of those might have a little tape. If you notice, on the box, it has a destruction guide. Right? Okay. Same thing, right? So if you get confused. Do you want us to open it? Yeah. Okay. So like I said before, the instructions are on inside the box. Okay. So in case you forget the step, it's right here. Right here. Right. Okay. Also on the inside, when you open the box, there's more instructions. Okay, should you get a step? <laughs> oh my God. Okay. Okay. Right? We also at the um, County Public Health, we have it in Spanish also, okay? So if any of your family members need it um, in another language, we also provide that, okay? This says public health expires. Yes, so those are expired. Okay, that's, we're only using those for training purposes. Training well, purposes, training well, purposes, training expire. purposes. How long do, if you buy one, do, is there like a year or two or ten or? Should be two years in the back. Two years. Yeah, usually about two years they expire. This expired October of 25. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. See, that doesn't have training on it. Doesn't have training at public health. Oh, okay. Good one, huh? I think that was all our training one. That was all our training one? Yeah, but it's okay. That's okay. That's fine. Yeah. No, you're good. That's the one you take home. <laughs> All right, so then uh, we've done all that, right? So you hold the nasal spray. So go back to your training device. Okay, this is where it shows a little bit of athletic ability. It's these two fingers here and a thumb. That's it. Two fingers and a thumb. Is it one injection? One injection, one hold. That's it. Push it in, it's done. Okay. Got it? Got it? Yep. Got it? Got it? Got it? The box is the hardest part. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Gently insert this nasal into either nostril, okay? Make sure you tilt the person's head back, okay, when you administer. Boom, 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 right? Right at the edge of the nose, okay? Please do not shove it, okay? I've talked to someone that from substance abuse that was overdosed. Someone gave them Narcan, and they shoved it up their nose, then they didn't have a bloody nose. Oh, okay. Right? So that's so not right fun. Here. All right, yeah. Well, on yeah. the See, Medication isn't going to get in if it's running out your nose. Correct, correct. But this is the proper way to go, right? Go ahead. Right. I think I've seen people do it like this. Try to hold it, push it, ram it. No. Okay. No. okay. All right. Ouch. Just this. That's it, right? No. Those will be the men. <laughs> You're right. You're right. <laughs> so now we say push the red button firmly, right? Make sure once you push it all the way in, that's one dose. Okay. All right. Okay. And is the plunger supposed to stay depressed at that point? Yeah, okay. boom, it's one dose, boom, done, okay. Um, so if the plunger doesn't stay depressed, does that mean that everything didn't get in there, or did they not get the full dose? You get the full dose, because, I mean, it's not going anywhere. they don't go anywhere, right? So you yeah. push it all the way in. Okay. Yeah, tilt that head back, push it all the way in. That's it, okay. Um, Tilt the person's head back and insert. Make sure you do one nostril at a time, right? So you administer one, okay? You wait five minutes. two to five minutes, right? And then administer the second in the opposite nostril. And do you always do two doses? Depends. It all depends, right? First, some people have been revived off one dose. Okay. Okay? All right? In the meantime, you're doing what? You need to call 911 to make sure that they're on the way, right. okay? Um, well, each kid has two, that's why we do the two. Correct, so gotcha. correct. So we moved on to three. three. Call for emergency medical help, evaluate and support. Get emergency medical help right away, give the person, move the person on their side in the recovery position, right? So you can see the demonstration, All right? Recovery position, okay? Watch the person closely. If the person does not respond by waking to a voice or a touch, breathing normally, another dose may be given. That's what we talked about, okay? 
um, maybe give them two to three minutes if available, okay? So that two to three minutes you and I was just talking about it, Bonnie, so you said two to five, two to three minutes, okay? Um, when you make that 911 call, in the emergency situation, two minutes can seem like a long time. We, we recommend you use your phone. Say, hey Siri, two minutes. Oh. Hey Alexa, two Siri. minutes, right? Okay, <laughs> all right? If you're by yourself, make sure you put the phone on the speaker. Okay, good idea, right? Um, so repeat steps two when using an Numenor can to give another dose in the other nostril, like we spoke, we spoke about, right? Opposite nostril. In addition to Narcan sprays, the veil will repeat two and three until two or three minutes until the person responds to a medical or uh, medical help has been received. Okay, so you stay there during that time. Make sure you take notes. So when medical does get there, you have a note and say, "Hey, you know, I administered Narcan at this time." Blah blah blah. blah. Okay, all right. Um, also, if the person comes out of the overdose and doesn't want any medical attention. What we tell them to do is make sure you drink some water, get something to eat, and get plenty of rest. <laughs> Don't do any more drugs. <laughs> Try not to, right? Okay. Um, they they have the right to refuse medical. You have, yes, exactly, right? So that's that's what we always just tell the public, just in general, saying, hey, make sure you get some water, get something to eat, right? And make sure you get rest. Okay. Um, other than that, yes, any questions? Um, how long after Narcan will they get withdrawal symptoms if they're a habitual user? Immediately. 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 Yeah. Cause I, and I don't know if people are waking up You're pissed. They are. Right. They are. <laughs> they are. It, is, it is a good um, thing to keep in mind that you're throwing someone immediately into withdrawal. You're blocking the same receptors that the opioids are acting on. And so what's happening is the opioids are no longer acting in the body, at least for 30 to 90 minutes. Right. And so um, what you want to do is get them to medical care before that um, op the opioids start acting again. Because uh, after that 90 minutes, they can go back into that withdrawal because the opioids are still in the system, but the Narcan is kind of um, like calming down after a while. Yeah. Um, has anyone here actually administered Narcan before? Yes. Yes. Not, not by nose, the old the, way. The old way. <laughs> Do you guys have any like experiences or that you want to share around that? Um, I mean, I can think of one really bad experience. There was this guy, so I used to be in the military, and thankfully I was working at the desk this day, so I was a dispatcher. And this guy took a bunch of oxys right before he came up to the gate. He was trying to kill himself, is what happened. He was in the military, wasn't happy. Um, as soon as he started to feel the effects of the oxys, he pulled up to the gate and immediately started seizing. And so we're going through the steps, telling you know the people what to do. They administer one Narcan, they waited two minutes, he's still seizing. He seized for, I can't even remember how long, probably like eight minutes. So after the first two minutes, they gave him another Narcan. They gave him another Narcan, they gave him three Narcans. The ambulance finally got there. I think they gave him another Narcan in the ambulance. And he seized the whole time, having seizure symptoms, foaming from the mouth, completely unresponsive, crashed his car when he pulled up to the gate. Completely limp when they open up the door to get him out, he just completely fell out of the car. So if you see someone in the car, make sure you're ready to catch him. <laughs> so they had to lay him down. They did the three at the gate, the two in the ambulance, and he did survive, surprisingly. So he was did he have any other drugs in his um, system? Just Oxy. Just Oxy. A whole mm -hmm. bottle of Oxy. He just took him right before the gate, chomped on him, and came through. Uh, the poison is in the dose, yes. Oh, the experiences. He was not happy. No. <laughs> I think it would be great to have a card to give to people that says the 90 minutes that, you yeah. know, and that why you need to get medical, right. mm -hmm. um, you know, and drink water right. and eat. Mm -hmm. They taught us to just write on their forehead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. the time. time for it, because when they get transported, it'd be like, just, you just do N, and then the time, they usually know it's an arcane time oh. that you've inserted. Mm -hmm. So just grab a Sharpie. Nice. And we do have um, cards that kind of, sh that will describe that. We'll yeah. give them out in the overdose kit app. Oh, yeah. Too. Mm -hmm. yeah. I did not know that. Your experience? Um, so I just recently left my boyfriend of four years and uh, he had an overdose in our home here in Angels um, last year. And I administered Narcan. It only took one dose. Took one dose. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
And sometimes too, especially up here, um, I used to work for law enforcement, you'll see a lot of methamphetamine mixed with fentanyl. Mm -hmm. So once you administer the Narcan, that's not stopping the meth. Mm -hmm. So you'll see, like I had seen one person was administered Narcan and when he woke up, he was like on this very high up. Because you're still very, very was like, whoa, yeah. yeah, whoa. <laughs> very, because the meth was able to get through, mm -hmm. but it stopped the fentanyl. Um, he nearly mm -hmm. died many minutes later. Because those guys came back, mm -hmm. and he still had meth in the system. It's complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you really want to... And why are they combining fentanyl with meth? I, because me, that it seems increases like the addiction yes. factor. Well, so um, you, you can stay up and get your opioid at the up and down so that you ride the, the well, wave. Mm -hmm. Dealers will intentionally like put fentanyl into meth supply because it's a it has a higher addiction yes. factor to it. Mm -hmm. And so you get addicted to the fentanyl portion, so you go back to that same dealer for the methamphetamine, but you're also get, getting the fentanyl with it. And so um, once someone is trying to get off of the meth, um, you're looking at you're still looking at withdrawal symptoms of fentanyl, so it's really it's a lot harder to get off of it when you, when fentanyl is combined. It's it's a marketing tactic essentially. Yeah. Well, they could build some huge tolerance too, because the yeah. methamphetamine may keep them awake longer, right. mm -hmm. and um, even though they have really high doses of, of fentanyl, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. and people might like that. Right. <laughs> so it's like the old speedball that killed yeah. uh, mm -hmm. whoever it was. I used to know his name. <laughs> <laughs> so the main things I want you to take away from this is being comfortable uh, administering the administering Narcan. Uh, just remember to keep things. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. I'm a senior advocate. Okay. Seniors are often on pain medications because they are in pain. Mm -hmm. um, we also have pink pieces of paper on our refrigerator that says it's a post. I forget what it stands for. It's physician's orders to yeah. blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. Do not resuscitate. Do not resuscitate. So, I, to, to being the devil's advocate, mm -hmm. because you're an advocate for keeping people alive, mm -hmm. personally, I'd be really pissed mm -hmm. if somebody came and got me off my methadone, not methadone, but probably morphine, um, because I really wanted to get rid of myself at that point. Mm -hmm. And I did not want anybody coming in to my house, except maybe a, a senior peer counselor, who was my friend. But I don't, I'm not calling the doctor for an intervention. And so I'm in this dual thing. I'm not out on the streets being aware of crisis situations. I'm in my home, I go to all my little friend things, that, that seniors mainly. Mm -hmm. um, as far as I know, my senior friends that are functional aren't using uh, heavy duty pain meds or cortadone, but maybe they are. Um, so I'm very ambivalent about carrying around something like this when I just don't see me being comfortable making that decision, even if I knock on my friend's door as a peer counselor, and they, I found them kind of down and out, pinpoint, stop breathing, know the routine, I'll call 911. I'm not sure I would do this. And there's, there's no liability right. for you to not, like, you can walk away and do nothing. That is that yes. is a decision. Yeah, and that's something yeah. I'm yeah. feeling that I would do. Okay. And that Just is because of who I am. Right. I'm a retired nurse. Okay. I, I'm I've got a history in my lung that's not related to any of this except an opinion. Okay. That you know I'm old mm -hmm. and. Um, I but do you, you don't know. You could be walking in the park. You could see somebody over to the side of the road. I'd call 911. I would call 911. Okay. No way am I going to whip this up. I'm not even going to carry this. Never. I will not carry it. But I am curious to know how you're doing all of this. That's why I'm here. And that is a personal decision made by everyone. You are. Yeah, I think yeah. everybody needs to know they can yeah. do that. Right. This is not something you shall do. Right. If you're a peer counselor, you kind of know what 
people's wishes are, or if they're getting into hospice area, oh, yeah. or absolutely, you know, if that kind of conversation at that point. Yeah. 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 yeah, but I also think the pulse is not really for a drug overdose. It's for if something happens, That's you true. don't want extraordinary measures taken, but. That doesn't mean just because I don't want to be on a feeding tube and a ventilator that I don't want you to give me Narcan because I accidentally took too many opioids. Mm -hmm. That were prescribed to you. That yeah. were prescribed to mm -hmm. me. That's true. So, you know, there's... I think that it's DNR discussion else. is something you should probably have with those individuals too mm -hmm. to see if that, that is a realm that, you know, yeah. that they feel that they, a boundary that they don't want to cross if that happens, but... Yeah. It, well, I can, I can say with my mother um, who who's older, 87, she's got a bit of dementia, mm -hmm. and I've had to take over her pain medicine because, mm -hmm. you know, she would get confused and take too many. Mm -hmm. So you fine. may run into a condition, you know, a friend who has some yeah. dementia, and it's not that they want to die or anything, it's just that they, they're not able to, um, uh, no, remember that they yeah. took what it they took. Mm -hmm. And also, personally, from my experience, especially with the story I told you about, we got a letter from that person's parents thanking us for having Narcan that day. Mm -hmm. Like, oh. imagine if we didn't have Narcan, you know what I mean? Like, that he would have seized and just died right in front of us. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you don't want to carry it, that's a personal preference. If you want to, you know, have a, a DNR and do what you got to do. It sounds like realistically you put yourself in a position where you're not having Narcan administered to you. So mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying, but you. why not carry it if it can save a life? If it, that's somebody's daughter, that's somebody's son. So yeah, there are big impacts on yeah. both sides. Yeah. So the main thing I wanted to make sure to take away is tilting the head. Okay, putting the person back in the recovery position. Okay, look for the signs. Like we said, the breathing. Right, the gargling noise. Right. Make sure we tap. Okay. Uh, yeah. This one of the part. One of the stage rubbing the chest, shouting the name. Okay. Those are the things we're looking for. Right. Make sure you call nine one one. Okay. Uh, wait the two minutes. Okay. Before we administer the other dose. Opposite nostrils. Okay. Get one. Give the other. Okay. Time that you administer. That's another thing, right? So when First responders get there, you can kind of give them uh, the time that you gave them the drugs. Okay. So the then, um, if, they're, if they're still not having a pulse or breathing after two doses, would you start CPR? I would I would do rescue breathing. Me, mm -hmm. personally. I would start rescue breathing. Or if you're certified in CPR, yeah, yes. Yeah, I'm certified in CPR, yes. But by that time, I'm hoping first responders oh, yeah. should be there, correct? Yes, ma'am. For those two minutes, between the first nostril and second nostril, are you putting them back on their back? And they should be stayed. They, they should be stayed on their back. back. Correct. Until you're done with both doses, then you roll them over. Correct. Right. Yes. Uh, so during that two to three minute interval between doses of Narcan, uh, can you do rescue breathing yes. during that time? Yes. Yeah, you can. Rescue breathing CPR. Yes. Uh, rescue breathing is just the breathing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. the, oh, okay. Just the breathing part. Um, for CPR, CPR you need to be certified. Yes. Yeah, you don't want anything four minutes not yeah, breathing. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> no. yeah. So everyone's pretty comfortable with that? Yeah. Kind of. We, we, we can do a demonstration at the end. Yeah, okay? we'll do a demo and we have right. another video to kind of reiterate the steps as well. I'm Jennifer Whitney. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist with a practice that focuses on addiction. I have seen firsthand what the use of opioids can do to individuals and families. The California Department of Public Health works to protect the public's health in the Golden State and help shape positive health outcomes for individuals, families, and communities. As part of this mission, the department is implementing a comprehensive approach to address opioid misuse and prevent overdoses. The purpose of this video is to support these efforts by providing information on opioid use, the signs of an overdose, and how to use the life-saving drug naloxone. In this video, you'll learn how to prevent an overdose, how to recognize an opioid overdose, including how to check responsiveness, how to store and administer naloxone, 
how to alert emergency medical services, how to administer rescue breathing, how to place the subject in the recovery position, and how to provide post-overdose care. Before we talk about how to recognize and respond to an overdose, let's take a quick look at what opioids are and what puts people at risk of an overdose. Opioids are among the world's oldest known drugs, typically used for the relief of pain. Some of the most common forms today include oxycodone, hydrocodone, methadone, heroin, and fentanyl. Naloxone is an effective and safe medication. Naloxone acts as an opioid antagonist or blocker, which can reverse an opioid overdose. Naloxone is not addictive and cannot cause harm to anyone, including those not suffering from an opioid overdose. Naloxone is easy to use. This training will discuss the various forms of naloxone and prepare you to use them. Always be sure to carefully read the instructions that come with each naloxone product, including how to properly store naloxone, which is usually at room temperature. But before we talk about how to use naloxone, we need to talk about the signs of an overdose and how to tell the difference between someone who is high or sedated and someone who may be suffering an overdose. Many overdoses are due to a combination of an opioid and other drugs, such as alcohol, benzodiazepines, and sleeping aids. In addition to mixing drugs, other factors can contribute to the risk of overdose. These include variation in strength and purity of the drug used, switching the mode of administration, for example, a change from snorting to injecting, lower tolerance after a period of abstinence, low tolerance from lack of prior use, using the drug alone, and physical health. In your interactions with those who use opioids, you may have opportunities to suggest strategies which can help them reduce their risk of an overdose. These include knowing their tolerance, knowing their supply, controlling their own high, being aware of the risks of mixing drugs, not using alone, or having a trusted friend to check on them, having a plan, talking with others, and using drug testing resources, such as fentanyl test strips, if possible. Not all strategies will be appealing to people, but engaging them in an honest dialogue about their use can be very beneficial. The symptoms of someone who is higher sedated but not suffering an overdose include relaxed muscles, slow or slurred speech, looking sleepy or nodding out, will respond to stimulation such as yelling, sternum rub, or pinching. Now, on the other hand, someone who's suffering an overdose will usually exhibit some or all of the following symptoms. Deep snoring, gurgling or wheezing, blue or grayish skin tinge, usually the lips or fingertips darken first, pale, clammy skin. The person will not respond to stimulation, and the breathing is very slow and irregular or has stopped and the pulse is faint. These symptoms occur because opioids cause respiratory depression or reduced respiratory function, resulting in increased levels of carbon dioxide and decreased levels of oxygen in the body. When breathing stops, the lack of oxygen can cause brain damage, and if the oxygen supply is not restored, the heart will stop, resulting in death. Here is the six-point checklist you should follow in the event of an overdose. First, check responsiveness. If unresponsive, administer naloxone, then call 911. While waiting for emergency medical services to respond, administer rescue breathing. If you are trained in cardiopulmonary resuscitation or CPR, this technique can also be used. Place the person in the recovery position. And finally, administer aftercare. If you suspect an overdose, check responsiveness. You can do this in several ways, by rubbing their sternum in the upper chest area, by yelling at them, or pinching them. If there's no response, you should administer naloxone immediately. Make sure that you've studied the instructions in your naloxone rescue kit. There are four common naloxone products. Nasal spray, like the one we're using today, Narcan, which needs no assembly, nasal spray from a syringe-type applicator, which requires assembly, an auto-injector, which can deliver a dose into the outer thigh, even through clothing, and injectable naloxone from a vial via a syringe. For the Narcan nasal spray that we're using, 
Hold the device with your thumb on the bottom of the plunger and two fingers on either side of the nozzle. Tilt the person's head back and provide support under their neck with your other hand. Place the tip of the nozzle in one nostril until your fingers touch the bottom of their nose. Press the plunger firmly to place the full dose into their nose. If after two minutes the person is still unresponsive, you can give a second dose in the alternate nostril using a new device. Administering a second dose before two minutes are up is a common mistake as people often panic. While this won't cause any serious side effects, it may exacerbate the withdrawal symptoms that come with the naloxone rescue. We'll talk more about this when we get to aftercare. If possible, have someone call 911 as soon as you've determined the person is unresponsive. If no one is available to do this, call 911 immediately after you've administered naloxone. Whoever calls 911 should state that the person is not breathing, is unresponsive, and that you suspect a possible overdose. The caller and the person administering naloxone are protected from any liabilities by California Good Samaritan laws. Once you've administered naloxone and called 911, begin rescue breathing. If you're trained in CPR and feel comfortable doing it, you can also include this technique. Rescue breathing is one of the most important steps in preventing an overdose death. Place the person on their back, place your hand under their neck, and tilt their chin up. Make sure that the person's airway is clear so air can get into their lungs by checking to see if there's anything in their mouth blocking their airway, such as gum, pills, or food. If so, remove it. Use a mouth shield or breathing mask when performing rescue breathing, if you have one, to reduce your exposure to other possible health risks. Placing one hand on the forehead, pinch the nose to prevent air from escaping out of the nose. Take a breath, cover the mouth with your own, and breathe out. You'll see the chest rise as it fills with air. Repeat this at five second intervals. If possible, stay on the phone with EMS dispatch until the emergency response crew arrives at the scene. Once you've determined that the person has emerged from the overdose and is breathing regularly, place them in the recovery position to prevent aspiration or choking. Kneel on the floor at the person's side. Place the arm that is nearest you at right angles to the body, bent at the elbow so that the hand is pointing upward. Pick up their other hand and place the back of their hand on their opposite cheek. Keep their hand there to guide and support their head as you roll them. Now, use your other hand to reach across and lift the person's knee that is furthest from you. Pull it up so their knee is bent and their foot is flat on the floor. Now, pull their knee toward you so they roll over onto their side facing you. Move the bent leg forward and away from their body so it's resting on the floor. Finally, raise their chin, tilting their head back to open the airway. People wake up from an overdose differently, and while violent reactions are rare and are usually associated with being given too much naloxone or waking up in disorienting environments such as an ambulance or emergency room or with police present, it's important to keep them calm and explain what has happened. Often they may not even realize that they had overdosed. Of course, you should make sure they don't try to ingest more of any drug. The effects of naloxone vary, lasting between 20 to 90 minutes. It's very important to call 911 and to stay with the person in case another dose of naloxone is necessary. Long-acting opioids present the greatest risk of resedation or a return of the overdose. So it's important to get further assistance if the person has taken a long-acting opioid, such as methadone, and to watch them for a while after they wake up. The most common result of a naloxone rescue is the uncomfortable feelings of withdrawal that accompany the blocking of opioids in the brain. Completion of this naloxone rescue training means that you are now equipped with the information you need to administer naloxone in the event of an overdose. Thank you for your time and your commitment to ensuring you are properly trained to save a life from an opioid overdose. For the California Department of Public Health, I'm Jennifer Whitney.
Good. This is just an overview of what to do after administering naloxone. Staying with the person as long as you can um, or until help arrives and then when de help does arrive, state that you administered naloxone. Um, it's, it's a good way or a good indicator for um, any emergency responders to either like keep on that treatment or notify the providers when they do get to emergency services. The person still responsive or unresponsive, lay them in the recovery position too. Um, if the person is responsive, they're going to be confused and probably not remember overdosing, so you can explain the situation to them. Um, or know that the person is going to uh, experience any withdrawal symptoms and then they may become uh, combative or agitated, so make sure just to be aware of that uh, potential reaction and then comfort the person if, um, if you're able to. So we can go into this uh, in a second. Q has um, some fentanyl test strips. In so uh, fentanyl test strips are a really good resource, especially when you're dealing in this realm of methamphetamine uh, being laced with fentanyl. This is a good way to test that drug to make sure that there is no fentanyl in there um, if someone is interested in doing so. But this is a kind of a demonstration on how to use this, how to read the test strip, um, and we work with that. <laughs> So like we recommend that if you come across any substance that you're not familiar with, make sure you wear gloves, okay? Um, all right, fit all test strips, very simple, okay? So what do you do is you open the packet, so everybody open the packet. Okay. Should have a little blue tip. See the blue tip? Mm -hmm. Hold the blue tip. Hold the blue tip. Hold the blue tip. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's your side, y'all. That's right. There's two blue tips. The dark, the dark, the dark blue, blue tip dark, or the light? Tip. Dark blue tip. Dark blue tip. Yep, dark blue tip. Okay. Dark blue, dark blue, dark blue. If you take your cup, I have put a solution in there. It's nothing but aspirin, nothing um, with fentanyl or anything like that. We're just using it for demonstration purposes. Take your cup. Everybody grab your cup. Okay. Okay. I would tilt it. Dark blue. Yep. Hold it dark blue. Oh, hold dark. Yeah, that's what I thought. Hold it dark blue. Hold it dark blue. Just like that. Just like that. Just like that. Okay. All right. So you see those lines? You see the line mm -hmm. here, 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 mm -hmm. here, this line here, yeah. correct? Okay, you got it right. Tilt your cup, barely put the water to that line. Well, and what should start happening is you'll start seeing the water go up to the top. Oh, yeah. You see it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rising up to the top. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You should say two lines. You could just keep it in there. Huh? Oh, yeah, yes. hold it in there. Hold it in there. And what's going to happen, you see one, two lines, right? It's tilted. Okay. You see it? You see the two lines? Mm -hmm. Boom. Perfect. Oh, yeah. Perfect. Like COVID test. Just like a COVID test yes. or a pregnancy yes. test, right? <laughs> yeah, right? That's too okay. long ago. Right? So, boom. You should see two lines like this. Yes. That means it's negative. Oh, okay. Two lines, two lines like that, right? Yeah. Two lines, right? Two lines, yeah. two lines, boom, okay? So if you come across a substance, uh, like bottom of sand, a family member, that may be out on the streets, something like that, like with the drugs, you come across that, um, you wanna make sure that they don't have any fit off. Like we recommend, make sure they have gloves. Do this little deal, it takes a little bit of water, just a little bit of a solution, I mean a little bit of the substance, Mm. And just like that they, they, they Yeah, uh -huh. you came across, right? So what, what if it was positive? Well, we know it had just positive. You can make an informed decision. No, I mean, yeah. what I'm asking. Oh, it would be one line. One line. One line. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, two, one lines line. two lines means negative. Two lines means positive. negative, right? Two, 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 two. two. Yes. yes. These can be also no, right? <laughs> one line. So everything's on the back, the instructions. 
If you forget a step, it's on the back. It's like the reverse of pregnancy. Yeah. yeah. It's the reverse of the pregnancy. Yeah. yeah. In terms of reading. All right. Also looks like the COVID test. Okay. Yeah. Instructions are on the back. So if you forget a step, it's on the back. Okay. These can be purchased at uh, on Amazon. Can't yep. remember. It's like maybe what eighty something bucks to hundred bucks for like fifty. For there's. Some, if you want to get a box of a hundred of them, they're eighty dollars. Eighty dollars, okay. Is, is there a place that people can get them for free? We are actually working on installing a public health vending machine in Health and Human Services, which will also include having these fentanyl testers, and then as okay. well as Narcan available to the public. So we will let everyone yeah. know when that happens, but uh, that is going to be one of our primary. Resources. And you also have different brands out. That you can get, you know, when you go on Amazon and you said, you know, I said other customers suggested this, that, right? And this one set, works the same way, it just comes with the water. And are there a bunch of fake ones out there, like happened with I haven't came across everything? everything. I would, yeah, you know, I would try to get possible. the ones that you know are kind yeah. of um, credible in terms of ones that we suggest, um, but these B and TX ones yep. are pretty um, accurate. accurate. Yeah. Can you, are those listed anywhere in the information that we got? Um, not those brands. They are going to come into the, you'll get a packet, packet with one in it. Okay. Um, and it has a name on it. Up. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've heard about um, marijuana being linked yes. with fentanyl. Will this work with that? Like, and so basically with fentanyl, it only takes basically like a tiny little portion of fentanyl right. to be detected in here. Um, so if you put, any part of the substance in there, okay. and if it has fentanyl in it, it okay. should be detectable. Um, however, it's hard because if a drug is or substance is mixed on the street, it can be concentrated in certain regions right. of that one substance. Um, so it's if you only took a piece that wasn't didn't have fentanyl on it, um, you're not going to get that positive result. Or um, so just be conscientious of that. But you. It well, I've got two young nieces, so yeah. 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 No, but it's important to at least have that research available. I yeah. do have to ask, how do they put fentanyl in marijuana? I mean, it's a powder. It's, it's a powder. It's just like yeah. powder. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you're... So you want to go to a credible um, dispensary. Resource, yeah, yeah. yeah. exactly. Right. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll leave it there. Mm-hmm. Uh, please no. Yeah. Well, I mean, because the marijuana I'm used to that I've seen, you know, they come in little buds, and I'm not sure how what you're doing if they're shaking powder into the bud. Or yeah, anything. it's yeah. it's not necessarily visible by eyesight. It only takes two or three, okay. like, what is it, specs. specs of it, I guess you can call it that, to actually impact someone. All right. Um, and so if that's on there and it's not necessarily detectable by your vision, then... Yeah. It, it it's, it's and you can also mix it in that stuff like the hard wax, right? Cannabis, that kind of deal, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure, that makes sense. Yeah. Does fentanyl work as an inhaler? Like if somebody's smoking marijuana? Yes, you can smoke fentanyl. Okay. I didn't know that. Okay. I'm not that drug educated, so I don't know. So what's the solution to that city that you're aiming for when you're mixing this? Like, say, for instance, I had, like, a gram of Coke that I wanted to test or something like that. Then how much would I have to put in there in order to test it? Not even a, a, a meal. Grain. The grain of salt. Okay. Yeah. There are typically instructions, too. Yeah. Um, there is one drug that you're going to want to put uh, more water in there for. I forget which one it is. But for fentanyl purposes um, or, like, um, cocaine, it's only a tiny little yep. bit that you need to put in there with a little tiny bit of water. And so you can see those. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. About an ounce. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, so I have some feedback forms. Um, and I, I can kind of skip this tester knowledge since you guys got a majority of the questions right in the beginning. Um, but I do have some resources on here that I can share with everyone. Um, These are all links to really good um, either harm reduction resources or opioid safety resources.